May the Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome. What a joy to welcome you to First Baptist. And we sense the joy of this season in this room. And I got to sense it earlier this day in something that you might not have experienced, which is that our Happy Hearts class met for the first time uh, since March of 2020, earlier today, in our gym. They will continue to build back that community and attendance, but we are so grateful and we share in the joy uh, that they experience as they gather together. And you will note in your bulletins that our beautiful poinsettias, our flowers in our sanctuary, are given by our Happy Hearts community in memory of four from their class uh, that we grieve and we remember who have died over the last year. And so we give thanks to God for their lives. And that is a source of joy as we come together this day and worship. And I wanted to make sure that you could share in that with me. But this is, Sunday, this is a Sunday that we do not mark as joy, but as, rather as peace. This is a peace Sunday. And we light in just a moment a candle of peace. But we remember also today that peace has a cousin. Peace has a cousin that is the justice of God, and that is embodied in Jesus' own cousin, John the Baptist, who says to us once again this day, prepare the way of the Lord. And so as our sanctuary has been prepared so beautifully by volunteers this week, as all of us come now to this place, let us do all that we can to prepare the way in our own lives and here in this community as we worship together this second Sunday of Advent. Welcome.
Will you please stand for this responsive reading and as a congregation join us by reading the bold type. See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Indeed, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But you can endure the day of his coming. And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. And then the then offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be with pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and in former years. Good morning. It is wonderful to worship with you today on this second Sunday of Advent. May you experience peace this morning. If you're a guest with us, we would love to have the chance to get to know you. If you're with us in person, there's a connection card in the pew rack in front of you. And if you would fill that out and place it in one of the offering plates as you leave, that would give us a chance to get to know who you are and have a record of your visit. If you're joining us online, you can find the connection card on our church website at fbcgso.org slash connect. As always, I'd like to draw your attention to the connections insert inside your bulletin. We have a lot going on and so many Advent opportunities. Details for all of them can be found in the Advent guide that was mailed to your home, is available on all of our info boards, and is available on the website as well. I do want to highlight a few quick things for you. First, there's a great opportunity for you and your family on Wednesday this week. 
You can sign up online to join members of our pastoral staff for a personal Christmas blessing and communion in the chapel. Time slots are available from 5 to 8 p.m., so go online and sign up to be part of this meaningful opportunity. Families of all sizes and ages are welcome. Additionally, you'll notice two important things about next Sunday morning. First, it is Children's and Youth Sunday, where kids, all of our kids and youth choirs will be leading in worship. I have a particular bias towards Margot's three- and four-year-old preschool choir, but all the others are excellent worship leaders as well. Then following worship next week, you'll want to plan to stay for church conference. We have ministry updates, we have the budget for 2020 to approve, and other important items on the agenda. And we say this often, but part of what it means to be Baptist is that your voice is not only welcome in these conferences, it is needed and helps us be the best community that we can be. So make plans to stay for church conference next Sunday after worship. And then the last thing for me this morning, if you're a college student, I would remind you that you're invited to stay after worship today for a free college lunch right downstairs in the fellowship hall. This is the last college lunch of the semester as you all prepare for your break. We would love to have you stay and join us for lunch. And now at this time, I'd like to invite all of our children to come down front to join Baker for children's time. morning everyone well as you may know we are in the season of advent right now and each sunday in the season of advent we light candles on our advent wreath and this sunday we lit two candles does anyone remember what the second candle stands for emerson Peace. You got it. It is peace. And when I hear the word peace, I think of friends getting along. I think of people listening to each other instead of arguing. And I think of people working together. So I've got some examples right here, some pictures. Some of them look like peace, and some of them don't look like peace. And I want to see which ones you think represent peace. So here's picture one, friends eating a meal together. You got it. Here's picture two, siblings arguing at dinner together. No, you got it, you got it, not peace. Smiling and shaking hands, you got it. Frowning arms crossed, turned away from each other, not even wanting to look at each other. You got it, you got it. Friends arguing over a teddy bear. Definitely not peace. Friends reading a book together. You got it. So you guys obviously have a really good understanding of what peace is. And all of these examples of peace are just a small part of the peace we can find in Jesus. So I have a challenge for you. This week, sometime this week, I challenge you to find peace for yourself and to help others find peace as well. Will you pray with me? And we are going to do our echo prayer and invite our grown-ups to join us too. Dear God, we thank you for Jesus and the peace we find in him. Help us to see your peace. 
to share that. Amen. And if you're in first grade or younger, you can head out these doors to junior church. As we share in a time of prayer this morning, I would, as always, draw your attention to our Covenant of Concerns. You can access our prayer list online at fbcgso.org slash prayer list at any time. It is updated throughout the week. And we want you to go to that list regularly and see the needs of our church as we pray for one another. But this morning, I would like to draw your attention to a few specific prayer needs that we have in our family today. The first is I would let you know that Coolidge Porterfield will be having surgery tomorrow, so we will be remembering him and also Brenda, of course, as she cares for him. I would let you know that Joyce Birch went to the ER briefly yesterday with chest pains, but nothing was detected, so she is now at home resting, but certainly keep her in your prayers as well. Benny Pember, as we mentioned last week, is in the hospital with complications from a recent fall. So please keep Benny in your prayers as they care for him well. And finally, I would mention Sarah Sears. Sarah was at Wesley Long most of this past week and then late Friday night was moved to the skilled nursing portion of River Landing. And this is one of those circumstances where I would remind you to pray specifically for Sarah but also for Tom as he cares for her so capably and so well. Please keep them in your prayers as well. And now please join me as we pray together. O oh God of waiting, prepare our hearts this Advent season. Make straight the paths in our hearts so that nothing would encumber you from speaking directly to us. Clear out anything in our hearts that we would have blocking the way from your wisdom and your love. Forgive us, Lord, when we focus more on things of this earth than on you. Forgive us when we are unable to see the world through your eyes because our hearts have decided that we know better than you. Forgive us, God, when we speak a message of exclusion or judgment instead of your message of an all-encompassing grace for all people. Accept our repentance and wash us clean. May our lives make straight the paths for others to know you more fully. May nothing we do be a hindrance to someone accessing you. May our words, our actions, and our reactions point others directly toward you. Make our rough ways smooth and inspire us to make smooth the rough paths of those around us. Show yourself to us so that we might fully offer you to the world. In your Son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip ruler of the region of Ituria and Trachonitis, there we go, and Licinius ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of the God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight, every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough ways made smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. This is the word of the Lord. Will you join me in prayer? God, we hear again these words of the prophets, words that speak even to our own lives this day. We pray, O oh God, that we would be the ones who do that work to prepare, to prepare in ways real and even destabilizing for all that you bring to us this Advent. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Of all the things that Christmas is, at the very first it was completely jarring, it was demanding, it was unsettling, it was even terrifying. It was a challenging time socially and politically. There were so many people who were feeling far from power, who were marginalized, whose names weren't as fancy as those read at the start of Luke's passage today. They were feeling off on the edges of God's activity in this world. People experiencing scandal and crisis in the grip of a murderous and maniacal ruler. So it makes sense that one of the predominant themes of the Advent and Christmas texts is that refrain that we hear throughout Scripture, do not be afraid, again and again in the story. Because we know why so many people jump with a start throughout the moments leading up to Jesus' birth. We understand it because we experience the same. Even if we've never been startled by an angel, we are people who know fear. And Christmas begins in that frightening and terrifying place for us, too. Because Christmas, the coming of God into the world through the person of Jesus Christ in the place of Bethlehem to bring that hope for salvation for all, it was not at first reassuring and stabilizing. It was a jolting awareness for a young teenage mother. It was a startled and unsettled husband-to-be. It was shepherds trembling beneath the sky. It was a frightening challenge to all of the ways of this world. As we remember so well this morning, on this second Sunday of Advent, when we hear those jarring and demanding words, once again from John the Baptist, prepare the way of the Lord. We hear these words in a prepared and adorned sanctuary with beauty and memory that surround us in this season they find us parading into the church in this beloved time, except in a few cases, perhaps. This morning, my wife Jenny received a construction paper letter from our first grader, Warner. And this was unsolicited, I have to tell you. It was crudely written, it was phonetically spelled, but it was something he wanted to communicate straight to the point, I am not going to church today. Now, I know you are shocked to hear that this kind of thing happens in a pastor's household. But in some ways, I'm receiving it from him as a sort of Advent message, or at least a more honest message for this Sunday, where we should all be asking ourselves if this is what we really want. Because John's message, now as then, it is a message of abrupt and jolting change. It's what the Bible calls repentance, a change of mind and heart 
that lead to a change of action in this world. And the truth is that many of us hesitate there. We fear such change. We might have our lives fairly sketched out. We might have things measured and controlled. We might have our reserves of strength maxed out already. So we're not eager to hear that there is something more that is being called forth in us. Everyone experiences their own level of this resistance to change. And neuroscience has actually shown that uncertainty registers similarly to failure in our brains. Studies suggest that most of us prefer a predictable negative outcome over any outcome that is uncertain. So much so that people will frequently choose the status quo, the way things are, even when change is the clearly healthier choice. And you might think of examples that you have known of this in your own lives. You might think of those people who stay in an unhealthy relationship, for instance, because of the fear of the alternative, or people who stay in a draining job for fear of something new, or people who stay in a pattern of living or thinking or believing for fear of what it could mean to admit that we were wrong, or to imagine something different than what we have known for all of our years. So change brings all kinds of discomfort and uncertainty, and we know this dramatically amidst all of the interruptions and challenges and changes that we have experienced in our lives over these last 20 or so months. And so if we are preparing anything this Christmas, 2021, well, it's for comfort and reassurance, isn't it? Because our days, they have been jarring and unsettled and demanding enough. And yet it is into this Advent as in any other year, that the voice of John booms out once again with that message, prepare the way of the Lord. Every year, the second Sunday of Advent takes us out to him, to John, out in the wilderness, the wilderness where the Israelites had wandered and wondered if God was with them. That home to lonely and frustrated people, people that had learned to survive on things like locusts and rainwater. That place for people that had left the cities and the centers to gather on the edges of things where people organize and dare to dream of change. And this is the setting, the wilderness, where eventually Jesus will make his first public appearance. These two, Jesus and John, they have been connected since John first leapt in his mother's womb at the news of the coming Messiah. But then this is more than childhood history or family connection. Jesus is associating with John. Jesus, in the beginning of his public ministry, chooses to connect his message, his vision of the kingdom, his promise of new life, to connect all of that to this wilderness prophet, John, and to that cry to repent for the kingdom of God is near, this vision of God drawing near to this world and calling people to change everything. Now, John is not the first to shout out with this message. Isaiah had thundered out before him, too. The prophet of Advent, Isaiah, was the first to proclaim, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Because in Isaiah's vision, the landscape, the earth itself, begins to change when the Messiah comes. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill shall be made low. The uneven ground shall become level. The rough places shall be plain. In other words, where we have only known the way things are, the prophet imagines God striking the earth and reorienting relationships and bringing righteousness to the wicked and justice to those who have known so much suffering in this world. Now Luke then echoes the words of the prophet as he here is introducing John. And so we are right to hear the prophet Isaiah in the background because after Isaiah it was a while until a voice like this was heard in Israel again. And then here comes John, appearing in the wilderness. And then comes Jesus thereafter, associating himself with this prophet, this message, in this place, in his first public act of all people. He comes out to John. Of all places, he goes out to the wilderness. Of all messages, he amplifies this voice of repentance and change because such change is absolutely core to what it means For God to come to this earth through Jesus Christ. And we hear this challenging word of change on this second Sunday of Advent. One that we have claimed as a peace 
Sunday, when we light a candle and with it we pray for peace. But do we want it really? What are we praying for really? What kind of peace do we hope will flicker within the shadows of this world? Because sometimes I think we have to admit that we're praying for something like tranquility. We might want John and Isaiah to turn it down a notch. It's too loud, it's too long, it's too disruptive. As many of us are trying to be comfortable, to be undisturbed in our lives in this season. But if it's tranquility or serenity that we are praying for, well then we are going to need a voice different than Prophet John's. Or how often are we praying for peace? But what we're really longing for in the deep places of our lives is something more like catharsis. Some sort of release from all of the troubles that we've known or a cleansing of our emotions that can help us to feel renewed without necessarily changing much at all. And if that's what we're after, we should be honest about it, but we're going to need a message different than repent for the kingdom of God is drawing near to you. Or I wonder how often we light a candle of peace, but what is flickering in us is something more like nostalgia, a longing for the sense of a simpler, idyllic, candlelit time, hearkening back to memories joyous and full and overwhelmed with the beauty of emotion and assurance, all good things, all gifts from God, in fact. And yet, if this Advent we want the warmth and the glow of the open fire, well then we're going to need a setting that is different from the wilderness. Yes, the fact is, if Jesus wasn't so insistent in leading us out to John, and if Advent didn't always come back around and force us to listen to this voice crying out for change, then we might settle for quiet and serenity, for nostalgia and warmth, and we might mistake these good things for the far greater, holier, and more demanding thing that we really need, and that we need, that we come to know as the Prince of Peace. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once warned of this temptation. Many of you know his letter from the Birmingham jail, written to white Christians, written to church leaders in Birmingham, the moderates whose messages were to wait patiently. Things are going to get better, Dr. King. Find a way beyond all of this disruption that you're causing in our city. Just let us negotiate. Let us try to broker a deal. Let us try to work the inside and change things little by little. And Dr. King said that he felt that the greatest obstacle to the struggle for civil rights for African Americans in the 1960s was not the people armed with water hoses or the people standing behind dogs, but it was the passive people. It was the middle of the road people. It was the quiet people tranquil, serene people, those who, in Dr. King's words in this letter, prefer a, quote, negative peace, which he defined as an absence of conflict rather than the presence of justice. And so this is the Sunday that we remember that the Prince of Peace is connected always to this prophet of repentance and change. This is the Sunday that we remember that peace itself has a cousin, and it is the justice of our God. And thankfully, there are prophets in our ears reminding us that the peace that we long for, it is not an inevitability. It does not come simply wrapped in swaddling clothes. No, we have to work for it. We have to be voices that shout out in wild spaces. We have to be those who work to straighten paths. We have to take risks to prepare the way for it. We have to listen to those proclaiming repentance and join our voices with theirs. And we have to consider how it all calls us to change. This is what was asked of me a few years ago in a Wednesday night small group, a round table Bible study that we were holding here at First Baptist. And we were studying the biblical text together. We were looking for that collective wisdom that can occur when all of our voices are heard and all of our insights are shared, and it was in the season of Advent, and as we studied the text of the prophets, and the voice of John, all of these voices amplified and crying out in the wilderness. Anytime I come to these texts, I always think what, at that Bible study, my dear brother Jim Plyler asked me, 
Jim posed the question probingly. Now, Alan, what do you think we'd be doing differently this year if we really believed that Jesus was coming? What if we really believed it? Wouldn't we prepare the way? Wouldn't we make the paths straight? Wouldn't we work to make hills low and valleys lifted? Wouldn't we smooth out the places where rough inequality prevails? Wouldn't we reimagine the places where injustice holds sway? Wouldn't we become restless with the way things are and envision again the way things can yet be? And wouldn't we do this even in ourselves, even if it frightens us, unsettles us, and calls us to be renewed? After all, Advent asks nothing of us that wasn't first demonstrated to us by God's own love. Because the incarnation, the coming of Jesus itself, is of course a story that demands change. It's a story about departing from what is stable and comfortable towards something that was needed. Jesus in very nature, God not trying to grasp it or settle into it, but instead becoming nothing, taking a different form, the form of a servant born in human likeness, enduring human suffering out of love. It evokes one of my favorite Advent poems that I share most every year, The Coming, which was written by the Welsh poet and minister R.S. Thomas. And it describes God holding in God's hand a small globe. And look, God said, and the sun looked. And far off, he saw people holding out their thin arms, as though waiting for a vanished April, a springtime to return amidst all that was rough and broken. And the sun looked at this. The sun watched. Let me go there, he said. And Jesus could have stayed. He could have stayed right where he was. He could have remained all settled and stable. He could have been right there amidst the peace, the tranquility, the serenity and comfort known at the side of God, but he looked at us. And the son said, let me go there. Send me right there, into the middle of that pain. Right there, where people are suffering and yearning for something more. And it must have been fearsome, maybe at times terrifying. And yet God in Christ came to show us what we can yet be. And time and time again, it is a story about change frightened, unexpecting young woman who becomes a bearer of God, a frustrated father-to-be who's not sure he wants it until he finds a new sense of call, a trembling farm worker who becomes beneath that sky a witness to the miracle on earth. And yes, all of us, with all of our fears and uncertainties, who are invited to become part of the very movement of God here in our place and time, But it just doesn't happen if everything stays the same. And so if we are really anticipating the coming of Christ this season, then we are inviting God to change us. And so once again, Advent leads us out, out to the wilderness, to the prophet John. And here again his words. Prepare the way of the Lord. But hear also behind them that deeper question for this Christmas. Do you really want this? And are you willing for your world, your life, to be changed by the coming of our God? May it be so in each of us this Advent. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
As our deacon chair, Debbie Honeycutt, comes to join me in leadership of the table, we come now to a time to gather for communion in this season. And what a joy to do so, hearing that echo of the prophet, being reminded how that possibility of justice and peace merging together, how Jesus saw that possibility in us, his followers, and he gathered his disciples at a table where he encouraged them to make it known in their lives. On the night he was facing death, he gathered them close to him, and he called on that comfort of God. And we are doing the same this day, and we have the opportunity to do so today and here in our sanctuary. We are so grateful for that, but that does involve, once again, uh, some careful logistics, a bit of choreography. And so this morning, I would let you know, if you have not experienced communion here in this place since we have made some pandemic shifts, you will be served by our deacons. They will make their way down the rows that are in front of you, where the ribbons have been let loose. And they will first come with the bread, and then they will come with the cup. We ask that you take and you hold these elements so you can place them in the cup holders in front of you in the pew. And then we will eat together and drink together after everyone is served and with the traditional words of remembrance that our Lord offered to us. But now as we come to this table, hear these words of invitation of Christ our Lord and remember what Christ sees possible on this earth and in our lives through the power of Christ coming to us again this day. And on the night that he was betrayed, after having blessed the food, Jesus took the bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Eat, and as often as you do this, remember me. In the same way, Jesus took the cup, and having given thanks, he poured, and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which has been poured out for the many. Drink this, and as often as you do, remember me. May we pray. Our God, may this bread and this cup be for us visible signs of your invisible grace that visits us anew this season, that calls forth in us new possibilities, and help it, O oh God, to strengthen us for the work of peace with justice to which you call us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
all who hunger, all who yearn, they will be fed. They will find what they need. And so Christ offers us these gifts again this day. So take this bread, eat, and remember. In the same way, take this cup and drink and remember. As often as you eat this bread, as often as you drink this cup, as often as you remember and take this on in your own lives, you show forth the love of God in Jesus Christ until Christ comes again. And so we commit ourselves to do that. And as we do, we will do what Paul tells us the disciples did with Jesus after sharing together in that meal. They sang a hymn together. As we sing this hymn, it is a hymn of response for all of us. It invites us to consider how we respond to the gospel and its call in our lives this day. And if your response is public, if you would like to become a member of this church, or if you'd like to profess something about your own faith in, in Christ, know that I would love to receive you right down front as we all stand and sing this hymn together. Prepare the way of the Lord. <laughs> Sorry, but that was kind of fun. <laughs> Wouldn't you have loved to have been there, to hear it, to see it? Um, but we are, we are members of the faith. We are um, in the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is timeless. And so we are kind of there now. So I ask you to open up your hearts and hear from him, even now, around words of stewardship. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, 
as we come to you during this time of the service and focus on stewardship, we first recognize that you are the creator of all things. We recognize you as the provider of our work, our relationships, our very lives. We recognize your presence among us even now. We come to you now with hearts of thanksgiving. We thank you for your creation. We thank you for creating us. We thank you for your plan of fellowship and relationship with us as stewards of your earth. We recognize it was your plan even before our creation. We see your holy plan with us in Genesis 1, 26, 27. Here as I pray the words of scripture. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. What a gift. We give thanks that humankind was created in your image and in full fellowship. We give thanks for your purpose and mission for mankind was not just to do acts of stewardship, but to be stewards, to have stewardship fully a part of our character so as to be fully a creation, a creation in your image. Thank you. But then sin entered the world. So we now also come to you, Lord, in need of forgiveness and guidance. We can be better. We have so graciously provided you have so graciously provided for us again by sending Christ to give a path for reconciliation. We celebrate his coming during this season and the measure of peace that his coming brings to our world. We ask your forgiveness, Lord, for the tension we have in our calling to stewardship of doing versus being. The tension that arises between doing acts of stewardship and being stewards as you created us to be. So lead us, Lord, into the abundance of life through full, full fellowship and stewardship. Empower us, Lord, through the guidance of your Holy Spirit. And so we come to you now, Lord, in need of transformation. You are so willing to show us how to come into full fellowship through Christ, how to how to be fully what you made us to be, how to be stewards in addition to just doing acts of stewardship. May we continue to be transformed through your mercy and grace as we recognize the difference between being and doing. May we give of our time, our talent, our finances. Indeed, may we live fully as your stewards through transformation of our hearts through the Holy Spirit, and may we celebrate the peace that it brings. It is in your name we ask it, Lord. Amen. We give thanks for all who have joined us today and all of the marks of the peace of Advent that we have experienced together in so many beautiful ways in this service through prayers, voice, and pulpit shouts and uh, the beautiful sounds of children in our midst and the beauty of music that has surrounded us this day. We thank our choir, how wonderful to see you uh, and to have that be again a representation of the wonderful work that you do and how many others in this church that make possible the work of this church also thankful for Eric Schmidt, who offered his gifts at the start of worship. Eric has been offering his gifts for many weeks now, primarily in our sound, as our sound engineer upstairs. Uh, but Eric, how wonderful to see these primary gifts of yours. Um, we thank you for that gift to this congregation and to God. 
our worship continues as we move outside because we have not concluded a service of worship until we have the chance to pass the peace of Christ with one another, to share together in fellowship, and we can do that in ways uh, more, un- more open and unrestrained outside. And so in just a moment, our ministers will proceed up the aisles. We encourage you to gather on the church steps in front of the microphone to leave the top level for any who are most comfortable there on level ground and not navigating the steps. And we will share a benediction outside and then have the chance to share together in fellowship, um, perhaps visit the snack table kids uh, or others, kids of all ages, welcome, um, and then share passing the word of peace with one another. And so having experienced so much of God's peace in this place, let us now carry it with us as we are going. And let me say to those who join us online, as I talk to the camera, how good it has been to be with you today as well. Uh, We know we have experienced some technical difficulties in recent weeks, and so we so appreciate and value you, and we are working hard to make this the best possible stream, even as we look towards upgraded equipment in the new year. Uh, But hear this word of blessing and benediction, all of you who join us online. Go in peace. And as you go, it is so important that you remember once again who you are, that you are daughters and sons of a living God, and you are friends and companions of Jesus, our Christ, and through the power of the Spirit, the peace of Christ, is it loose in this world through your very lives. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.